when you write something down and cross it off, it creates an endorphin in your head. I wish I recorded more and took more pictures at the beginning of my business so I could show people literally I started with a pickup truck and a chainsaw to now having 30 full-time employees well in seven figures a year. You're listening to Stories from the Top, an inside guide to better business development. We are here with Jeremy Serkin, the founder of Executive Tree Care, Executive Landscaping, Sharon Storage, J&D Housing, Firewood Mo, Delco Fleet Services, LLC. Anything else? It's it, it's it for right now. I've had so, a lot of businesses. Yeah, so when someone asks, what do you do? What is your usual explanation of all that? Um, man, what do I, so how do I describe myself? Um, more like an enterprise. Yeah, than anything, uh, we we can, you know, we're, we're really capable of of doing a lot. So at this point, it's more of an enterprise um, founder, but we're um, we have a lot of moving parts. We're, but but we we're 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 tree care at for, first and foremost. Um, that's what we do is was we do tree care, uh, certified arborists. You know, we um, take care of a a lot of homeowners properties and parks and a lot of stuff for townships and counties and stuff like that so first and foremost that's what what i do is tree work um that in in turn has seeded other things to come into fruition throughout the years so that that's kind of where that list of llc's comes into play more or less okay cool so what did you originally go to school for (laughs) Uh, that's a funny story. So, um, so I went to high school. I went to Monsignor Bonner High School in Drexel Hill. It's a, an all boys Catholic school. Uh, that's and that's right up the street from where I grew up in Drexel Hill. That's where I'm born and raised from. And then uh, went to high school. And w- down the shore was a big deal for us back then. Going down the shore every summer, and we would all get shore houses. And uh, me and all my buddies from Bonner would all have separate houses. So, you know, I, I played lacrosse more or less. And when I played lacrosse, there was a bunch of dudes going to Shippensburg and they were like, yeah, we're going to Shippensburg. I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll go to Shippensburg, whatever. So I signed up for Shippensburg, sent in my application and they accepted me. And then, uh, I was down the shore all summer, didn't visit the college once, uh, just kind of did my thing and then showed up four days late to, to ship. And, uh, was like, yeah, I'm here. And uh, I showed up. My buddy, my buddy Jim Cody, who is uh, a Bonner grad as well, he he signed up for nursing. He's like, yeah, man, we'll, we'll work like four days a week. And we'll make like 80 grand a, a year. He's like, it'll be great. I was like, all right, I'm in. So I signed up for nursing. I went to Shippensburg to become a nurse. And uh, I showed up four days late. I missed all the in- orientations, all that. And uh, I went to like, three days of classes and it was like human biology. It was like all these things that, you know, I'm like a business oriented individual and I always have been too. There's, you know, from the past, but, and I realized what I got myself in. I was like, Oh man, I'm out of here. So I went and I switched majors like three, four days into it. And I switched to uh business, uh, business, something business, um, Something in business. I don't even really remember, to tell you the truth. It's been so long. And uh, I went to ship for a year, took business classes, and I was like a decent student. I got C's and stuff like B's, whatever. I didn't really care, to tell you the truth. And I went home every weekend, and I went to different colleges with my buddies from high school. And then uh, at the end of the year, I was like, all right, I'm out of here. So uh, and then I went to, down the shore. Uh, we went, I went down the shore four summers after high school. And uh, I went down the shore, and then... We uh, went, I kept going on the shore. I was going to community college, and then the Phillies won the World Series in 08. I tore my labrum, and I took a, a semester off, and then I was just, like, working odd jobs and side jobs and stuff, and then I, was, I went back to school for my last semester to complete my business administration, and that's kind of where everything started, more or less, with, with CCL property management. So you said you had biz- a business mind before that. What were you doing that got you into that business mindset before college? A lot, a lot. So I, I've had a, my first job in the, was when I was 11, actually at a, 
a warehouse up the street from where I own my two and a half acre lot, my commercial lot, uh, Sharon storage where, where executive is stored at. So, but it's in Sharon Hill. My first job was at 11 years old, carrying fabric, um, to and from areas. Cause my mom is, uh, she was a home economics teacher where she taught cooking and sewing. And so she got me involved with, uh, this warehouse and I was doing that and I was washing dishes and then I was doing landscaping by 12 or 13 and, you know, always working. And then, uh, like for instance, in, in high school, I'll give you a business minded thing. They, uh, we, at Bonner, we had a candy store and at the candy store, one of the most popular items was fruities. So fruities are like flavored Tootsie Rolls as well as flavored Tootsie Rolls. So everybody loved them. It was like two for five cents and they got rid of them. And overnight it was like, everyone's like, yo, what, they got rid of fruities. So I went out that weekend, I bought 15 bags of, uh, fruities and I bagged them up in dollar bags. And it was like five bucks a bag came out to like 15 bags and I sold 15 bags and I made like eight, six, 800 bucks on Monday and it went by like noon and then the disciplinarian, he called me in, which is funny. His mom just called me for tree work yesterday, but, um, <laughs> he is, he called me in. He's like, Mr. Serkin. He's like, do you know why? We got rid of fruities and i was like no i don't even know what you're talking about and he's like we got rid of fruities because their trash is everywhere he's like we got rid of them the last week and now they're back because you're selling them i was like no i'm not and so you know always always trying to like you know make an honest buck type of deal so you find what people need and then you sell it to them so so I, when did you start all your businesses then after school? So, yeah, I did the whole little college thing, right? Did the whole little college thing. And um, all right, how it really started was this. So I always had like three jobs at the same time. I always was like really working like a lot of hours. I come from a house. It's just me, my mom, brother, and sister. We I grew up. My mom's a school teacher. My our dad went astray at a younger age. And that's a whole story. There's a whole story in that, but it's, you know, and it was just us and my mom's a hustler. So she would work and then she would work in the basement doing, um, like reupholstering couches and, uh, she could reupholster these chairs, like just, just as perfect as they are now they could look if they were damaged and she can repair them and stuff like that. So she teaches kids how to cook and sew and then she does that. So she, she's a real hustler. So I got that attitude from her. Um, always had three jobs coming up. And, um, you know, that's just kind of molded me as a person, but, um, <laughs> I think I got a little off topic. What was the question originally? Yep. Just how did you get, get started and actually, yeah. All right. All right. So, so do, doing landscaping, I really saw opportunity there. I worked for Hollywood landscaping in the age of like 13, 14 up in, uh, Aston and I saw opportunity there and I saw the way the guy dealt with customers and it was my mom's friend. So, and he ran a successful business and he still does, uh, for a long time. And I saw the way it was done and I was like, wow, this is how this guy's making money, huh? So, and I had a pool and he had everything, you know, I grew up in a row home for a while and, and that was, I was like, wow, this is like really amazing stuff. So, um, all that being said, I, I took a look at it and I was like, man, I could definitely do this. So the, I, in the winters, um, Bring you later in life. That was when I was younger. But bring you later in life. In the winters, while I was at this community college, when I came home from Shippensburg, in those couple of years, we would always get like bad snowstorms. So I worked at Ace Hardware. I bought a snowblower for I was I don't know like eighteen, nineteen, something like that. I bought a snowblower. I got like thirty percent off because I worked at the store, and then I go out and I'd snowblower people's driveways. And then when I got to be like eighteen, nineteen, I started going out on snowstorms and I would rent a U-Haul pickup truck and well, I would allocate a four wheel drive pickup truck, um, through U-Haul and they would ship it in to the township line location in upper Darby. And I would get one of my buddies who was 25 to sign for me on it because you couldn't rent a vehicle under the age of 25. And so I go out and I print up like 5,000 flyers that say like, we'll snow blow your driveway. And I'd hand them out in the bond shopping center in upper Darby. And then on, in Newtown square. And I get a Gladwin and I'd spend like the entire day, 24 hours or 48 hours prior to a storm, I would just drive around and I would sit at a parking lot for like two hours and I would circle it. And the turnover rate is good right before a storm at a, um, 
at a uh, grocery store, like cars are in and out. So you can do like a whole section, come back and have all new cars. So I would really try and just nail those bigger areas. And then I would get calls and I was, you know, 17, 18, 19 years old, uh, make like three grand, four grand a day cash. So it was fantastic. I was like, all right, sweet. So then uh, comes 2009, I buy going into that winter. Uh, I was like, all right, awesome. I'm going to buy a pickup truck. So I had like 30 grand saved up. I went out. I bought a pickup truck off the sky, local guy, for six grand. And uh, that February, I started in 2010, I started an LLC of CCL Property Management LLC, February like 2nd or 4th or something like that. So um, in 2010, and uh, I've been plowing. So, so then, uh, all right. So then I bought the plow truck, right? I get out of the whole U haul snowblowing making a couple grand a day I go out and buy the plow truck for six grand and then <laughs> that winter we had our like second worst winter recorded in philadelphia we had like 90 something inches in 2010 so i basically drove up and down route 30 knocking on doors at like three four in the morning on um all these corporate doors like just trying to get my foot in the door to be honest and i was banging on doors like and i was banging on doors all up and down route 30 i literally just came off it and i was i passed what's funny one of my friends in the doctor's office right across the street now from my first account ever so i ended up getting tires plus and jiffy lube in paoli and the one and tires plus and Bryn Mawr, and they're like so tight real tough jobs to do in snow but i got them and then uh, as other contractors failed on other sites, they would refer me in because I did a good job and then I would get more. By the next year, I had, you know, what did I have? I have like four Jiffy Lubes and like six tires pluses. So uh, literally started by knocking on doors. Um, so that was that winter, 2010. Then a big, uh, so then fast forward out of the winter that year, that first winter, I go out and make decent money doing snow. Um, I, I'm still like young. I'm 20 years old, maybe 20. I'm 20 at this age. And then I go come out of that winter. We had a good winter plowing. I picked up these two corporate accounts. I was like on top of the world, you know, um, and fast forward a little bit. We get in the spring, I buy a trailer. We start doing some landscaping. I, and then I watch my buddy climb a tree, uh, my buddy, Timmy and, watch him climb a tree and I'm like, all right, sweet. Like I can do that. So 45 minutes later I'm climbing trees with him. This isn't like May, July, or this isn't like May. So then in June, a terrible storm comes through Drexel Hill where I grew up and was living with my mom at the time and running the business out of her garage, literally. And uh, this terrible storm comes through and totally trashes the neighborhood. And, um, I, there was just so much work going on. So I went out and I rented a, a chipper and a dump truck and I went out and I made 30 grand in a week. And, and I thought I was like, man, that's awesome. Like I just killed it, you know, 30 grand in a week. Now one, you know, that now that, that 30 grand could essentially, if, if done the right way, could be like a half a million bucks. Like that's how much I missed out on what the right way to do it was. But that's a different story. So, um, so you were young at this time. Did you have anybody advising you? As nobody, you nobody advised me. So that's funny you ask. So when I was doing this landscaping prior, I went out, I bought a lawnmower in like April, May, and I had this big argument with my mom. No one's ever co-signed for a loan for me ever. I've never had a co-signer for a loan. I've never had any help. I've never had any funding. I've never, it's all been organic. So when I, somebody tells you they can't do it, it's like, I'll show you a different story. But now I've never had a co-signer. I've never had any help. I've never had anybody uh, aid me. All. Well, now I have mentors that I've sought out over the years, but not in the beginning. So, yeah. So this big storm comes through. We go out. We do tree work. And then I uh, was going to Europe with some friends that, that summer. And... Uh, went to Europe that summer. And before I like made a deal with a guy with a dump truck, I came back and I owned this dump truck. So then uh, I was like, all right, I own this dump truck. I got to make the payments. And then we just started doing tree work when I got back really like pretty much hardcore. And then it's evolved into a uh, nothing but a tree company. And now we do like a lot of planning and landscape design and stuff like that as well. But tree work 
it has its ebbs and flows. When in my industry, when a storm comes through and we're dealing with insurance and we have to literally drop everything we're doing and just focus on taking trees off of houses, we get paid pretty well to do it. So um, we build up off of that and we'll have to expend that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It comes away from the profit. It just comes right out of profit. But there's a lot of things that come out of profit that are just kind of part of the deal in my industry that uh, people would say, why do you do that? You're spending $10,000 on this. And it's like, well, I feel like I'm going to get this out of it. So it's training. There's all sorts of things that people would say I, I more or less waste my money on. But that's why my company is is is, is uh, in good standing after 14 years. So, you know, We still get great reviews to this day, which has got a lot to say. Because for the first seven years, I climbed. Like, I was the climber. And I was literally answering the phone in the trees. At my, my best hire ever uh, was when I got my, like, personal assistant, uh, Allison. She, I had uh, another buddy's wife, my other buddy's wife, Lauren. And uh, she was great, but she they were having more kids. And then I got it with Allison who I grew up with her sister. And when she came on, I guess it's been like six or six years ago. Um, it really helped my business grow. Cause I could stop answering the phones like while I was in the tree. And then I got away from being in the tree. I guess the last time I've climbed, it's been like six, seven years ago now. So it kind of all changed six, seven years ago when I decided to make that change of like letting go of a lot of that, um, power, like, just uh, micromanagement of it. You got to let people do their jobs. And then I learned, I learned through trial and tribulation of, you know, you let people do their jobs and they do, they do a pretty good job if you train them the right way. And so, yeah, I wanted to ask about that transition from where you were doing a lot of pretty much everything, everything yeah. to now full three crews going out and you're on a couple jobs here and there. How did you do that scaling? What was like your strategy since it doesn't sound like you had a lot of experience in doing that at that point? So in the, in that meantime I guess I would say I met uh I met a mentor maybe. Yeah, I met a mentor. This guy around here, mainline guy, owns a huge tree company and uh he I don't know, he kind of I would ask him questions and he would tell me I should probably try to do this or I should probably try to do that. So when I uh I decided that it was time to hire another sales arborist, I got Doug my uh, sales manager, he came in three years ago. I was running everything up until three years ago, pretty much. And then uh, I got hired Doug, who came on. He was a certified arborist who <clears throat> owned his own tree company for 15 years. Uh, I think 08 was real uh, brutal. And then um, he went to work for the private sector where he worked for like he worked for Davey and he's worked for all sorts of big tree companies. And then he worked for in the chemical industry too, for a while. So, uh, I brought him on and he deals with a lot of my compliance stuff with like DOT and stuff like that. But he helped me like also, he told, he told me a lot of good books to read about structure and I would read them and I would just try to implement it. You know, not that I wasn't already doing it anyway, but like he definitely helped me fast track a lot of that stuff that, um, and, and he's great at uh, building structure on paper, and then we just imp implement it uh, throughout the company. So, any books that uh, really stood out to you that you'd recommend? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, the E Myth is. I'm actually reading it for the third time right now, or listening to it. I don't. I don't really read, but I, I listen to books. But um, the E Myth is one. What is that about? Uh, it's about a girl who makes pies, to be honest, but it's about, um, so, uh, low and short, I guess it's about <clears throat> everybody doing their job. Um, so you guys, you guys are podcasters, right? And you guys shoot videos. So let's say we partner up and I do tree work, but, oh, I'm sick one day and I need you to go do tree work and I'll do your, uh, podcasting and videoing. Well, you know, it's just all going to get all screwed up. You know, it's not going to work out. So it, it, it goes in the depth of about, like, um, not 
I don't know. It's go, it goes from like the adolescent stages of business into the lo- lo- longer stages of business, which now I'm at. And I, I literally am listening to the book for a third time. And I'm like, oh man, this is spot on. Uh, yeah. It's about this girl who make pies and how she, she loves pies, right? And when she loves baking pies, as she enters the market and starting her own business, but by the end of it, she hates pies. And it's like, you know, it's, I don't know. It's just, it, so it really like scaling, nails scaling yeah, and growth. Yeah. It really nails uh down and then it, it nails down thoughts too, because like when you get too big or something or whatever the case may be, where you, you get in yourself in a situation where you got all these balls up in the air and then you're like, should I get smaller? And and that's always a thought in, in business owners minds. And you know, it's a, it goes over why you shouldn't and where you should lean towards it's it's a really good book everybody that enters business should read it i've given it to a bunch of friends like i've told a bunch of friends guys that uh i these these this my first two employees they started a uh, sneak peek and it's a really good uh apparel they make t-shirts and uh company they stuff like that and they they uh the guy bob he's really good and um he read it and he said it's, it's now in his top five and he reads a lot of books so yeah now it's a great book the e-myth yeah it's and, good any other ones you'd recommend uh, i mean rich dad poor dad but that's like you know um can't can't kill me or can't hurt me by goggins is good uh extreme ownership is good by wilnick jocko wilnick um uh the, na- the millionaire next door is good um, the richest man in Babylon's good. Um, man, I gotta think. I'm just thinking of the ones I've done recently. I got if if I went through my uh, my Amazon book list, I could definitely pull up some more. But that's right. Yeah, that's weeks and months of reading for most people. You already gave us. So I think yeah, yeah, it's, it's a couple. There's a couple to start with. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, they're all good books. Anything that that takes you out of your own mind and lets you know that like the thoughts you are thinking are the right thing is good because it's so easy to get caught upstairs in your own head. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Everybody does it. So yeah, I wanted to ask a little bit about, um, it sounded like you were doing a lot of just door to door marketing when you started. Yeah. How has your marketing evolved as you've scaled up and created all these extra brands? So, um, all right so a lot a lot of our marketing is now eddm which is everyday direct mailing and then uh our online presence is really strong and i've got a really good online partner which is who's really helped me grow uh shout out to rob wright and um small talk media he does a great job so um that's how i've helped grow i've i do a ton of community days so I remember like two years ago, I think I did like 14 different community days where I'll go set up a table every Saturday or Sunday and I'll hand out information about trees. I'll hand out free candy, stuff like that. I'll hand out koozies. We'll just go talk with the community. And then, I mean, those days, there's been some that I've pulled 60 estimates out of in like media township day i've gotten 60 estimates out of just going and talking to people and um and then they come up and they're like oh you know you know my cousin knows you or you know so and so and then also my wife has a huge family so i'm like my wife's dad's one of 15 so she has 83 cousins on her one side so i literally always see family somewhere somewhere at some location so um yeah i do a ton of community work um we do um, now we're doing more like, uh, working directly with shade tree commissions in different areas and stuff like that. So, yeah, you were saying you do a lot of work with parks and rec too, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. How did you get those government contracts? Um, through, I guess through people I know, but more or less, but also doing a good job and them recognizing it they see our trucks in the area it's not like they just can hire somebody so they have to hire one of the x amount of reputable companies so say there's like five reputable companies up there they got to hire one of the five and they got to pick so um yeah being reputable and being consistent because they can call you at any time things can happen so 
Do you guys do a lot of referral business from customer to customer? Like- oh yeah, that's our that's our number one. I'd say is is somebody telling somebody else about us. Yeah, which yeah, I guess that all comes back to your reputation. So, is there anything you guys do like specific reputation management? Anything like to just really make sure there's no negative press or stuff online about you guys? Um, we try to follow up to make sure customers are happy. We can literally, it's so hard. Uh, customers, you can't make everybody happy. Like it's, it's so funny. I like, I make a joke that every time I go somewhere and they'll be like, Oh, you did our tree work. And I always just kind of, I go, so how was the experience? You know, like is, you know, it's, you can't micromanage everything. Um, it's really tough, but now like over the years, you know, we're at over a hundred positive uh, reviews on Facebook, over a hundred positive reviews on Angie's list. We're probably up in the twos and threes, stuff like that. But I stopped taking lo- watching track after it hit a hundred, but I was like, all right, cool. We're in good standing. Um, yeah, negative reviews are going to happen every once in a while. Uh, it, I mean, not, it doesn't, not very often. And if it does, you try and like save negative reviews only really happen after you've gone a certain extent so many times that now this person's going out of their way to make a bad review about you. Like that's, you know, not everybody just goes around and makes bad reviews. So, so you're saying you can kind of nip it in the bud, catch it early. Yeah. You can catch it earlier. Yeah. Yeah. But then some people you just can't make happy and they're going to, they're going to do what they're going to do anyway. Do you have any like policies that you put in place to really try to have that excellent customer service? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we have like uh, altering cranes, ATCs, and we've noticed over the years that like they are not the, they're not the most driveway friendly when it's like uh, an older driveway. So if it's a nice new driveway, it's no big deal. But if it's a something that's like out of code and it's already banged up, we'll put down three quarter inch plywood to put our crane on there just because we don't even want to have the conversation about like, well, you didn't protect the driveway, this and that. And so, and it does help protect it big time too. So, but you know, you're bringing on some equipment on people's yards. Yeah, absolutely. You have to figure it out. We have protection mats on all our trucks. So when we put a truck on the lawn, we back it straight on the protection mats where the protection mats are rated for 60 ton. Um, and that's a, you know, that's a way that we can avoid putting ruts in people's lawns and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, we, we always are implementing things that will, any way that the customer can call us less and we can create less friction in between and less points of contact, we would love to do. So if if the customer calls us once we go out and contact and have a conversation with them twice, send them an email, they approve everything. We reach out to them for um, scheduling a third time. We go out, do the job, done, fourth, you know, and then send the email, uh, get that, get paid, and then hopefully that's it. So, like, you know, five or six, five to seven times touches per customer, I'd say. But if, if it's more than that, you're like, oh, shit, here we go. Because it becomes an office thing. And then, you know, everybody's talking about, oh, this customer keeps calling and, you know, it becomes a something. Yeah, we, we implement things all the time to try and avoid situations as stated, rots, you know, damaged concrete, things like that. Things that are naturally probably going to happen anyway, but we try to avoid it. Do you guys ever like turn it down, turn down a job because of the logistics of the property? Like, for example, <clears throat> my house has no real access to the backyard. And last year I had to get this huge oak tree taken down. And I had called like five people and everyone either way overbid just to not get the job or some people straight up just wouldn't call me back after they looked at it. Yeah. Um, it really depends. I mean, we'll take on majority of the work, but if we got to charge you for it, we got to charge you for it. Uh, if it's something that's unaccessible and we got to take it down by hand, we'll just price it out. Like, yeah, this might take three days. We will always call it worst case scenario. And then we'll say, this is going to take three days and then we'll charge what we think's fair for how many guys should be there for a day and what equipment's needed for the day. And it, sometimes it does come down to like, you know, 15, 20 grand, take a tree down by hand. But it's like, you don't even know what we're up against. It's like, I just looked at a tree yesterday for a guy in Bryn Mawr that we can take down. He's got some dead trees up by his pool, but his whole backyard's overgrown. And he's got this big Norway maple. It's all down in this gully and there's no way to get a crane there. There's nothing. So, you know, I just told him a, a, high number but a, a, a still a reasonable enough number to get the job but 
one that I might have to go and with and buy my guys lunch for two days at, you know? So, you know, yeah, we, we'll take it, but we don't take everything with, there's, a, you know, I'd pick up dog shit for the right money, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to ask a little bit about your sales process as you stepped out of that too, it sounds like. Yeah. How, how has that been handing that off and training people to do what was, you know, your main thing of doing all the sales? Yeah, yeah, it was. So, all right, when when my business started to evolve, I had this guy, Matt, with me for 10 years. He was with me for, came in two years after I started and was with me until year 12. He left, well, in July, he left two years ago, and that's rough. It's a rough breakup still. But, uh, um, so I he was doing a lot of sales for me, too, because the calls would come in like wildfire from like year seven to 10 and I was doing them and he was doing them. Um, we were both selling. And then, uh, I bought out a small company, Abracadabra tree. Uh, this guy drew, uh, canal who now he just runs a crane and, um, he just wanted to run a crane more or less. So I got that, bought that small company. And then, um, Doug came to work for me in 2020. He's a certified arborist who took over a lot, took a lot of sales. It was me, him and Matt. Uh, so we had three sales reps and then I think I hired another one, Mike, this guy, Mike, that came on. And then, uh, in 2021, he worked for me for two years, about 2020, 2021, something like that. Um, and I just kind of oversaw it and it's tough, man. Cause, and then I, and then we ended up buying another company and that's where I got my sales rep now, Greg. Uh, so I've, now I've dug and Greg as my sales rep, Matt and Mike no longer work for us, but, uh, it's tough. It's a tough transition because you got to trust guys out there. One to place your equipment, millions of dollars of equipment in the right places. And then two, and to make sure the guys are going to not freak out about some crazy hard job and two get the right money for it. Um, so it, it's tough. A lot of trust goes into it, but I did it for so long that, you know, I, they, these guys kind of knew what I wanted, but then also when I bought Greg's company, J and G tree in 2021, maybe or 2021 or two, um, he is a phenomenal arborist. So, um, you know, he, him and Doug in during businesses, Greg's worked for another tree company for over 10 years and then in his own business for a couple of years when the one chart company closed and then, Doug and Zoom business and worked for multiple um, uh, corporate tree companies. So I, I kind of just handed them the torch and do things go wrong every once in a while? Sure. All the time things happen. That's what my industry is all about. But that's why we have to be so good on our schedule that we have to have backup plans for backup plans because the rain affects our schedule. Um, the wind affects our schedule, putting cranes in the air. Um there's so much that affects our schedule. Like being too hot sometimes will affect the schedule. Being too cold will affect the schedule. If it's too hot, it's considered a code red with Pico. If we're doing a Pico job, they won't shut the power off during a code red. If it's code blue, which is like not – code red is 90 degrees and above five days in a row. It's like heat wave stuff. <clears throat> they can't shut off people's – um. Uh, air conditioned for X amount of time, and then same with the winter. So, yeah, we have variables all over the place. We're constantly trying to uh, pivot, and then it takes a lot to do. So. so you mentioned you bought two companies. Mm -hmm. uh, can you just explain a little bit about how you assessed if a company is, is worth buying and how you value that and what that process looks like? Yeah. Yeah. Um, these were, like, smaller companies, where there were just like three, four guys. And I was like, oh man, if, if we could get those guys over to us and, you know, also acquire the phone number, like that would be fantastic. So these were like shorter deals where it wasn't as extensive because I didn't want any of their equipment. I had all brand new equipment. It was more or less like, I'll give you X amount of money for the phone and I'll pay you X amount to come over here. And in the first deal, all I got was the phone number. I think I gave him like 10 grand for the phone number or something like that. And, uh, I still get calls on to this day though. It's been six years and then five, five years probably. And then, uh, the other one, four guys came over with it. Three of the four are still there. And this has been over, it's probably been two years now. And, uh, we bought the phone number. We paid that. We didn't want any equipment. And then we offered salaries. We have health insurance. We've paid vacation. We've paid days off, uh, we just do jobs the right way so we're not killing our guys. We have all the right equipment 
Um, Did the owners come with the companies? Yeah, yeah. One of the owners left uh, to go back to doing, I don't know, more construction work. And then the other guy is Greg, who's still our sales arbor, who's like the best. He's just, yeah. Couldn't say enough good things about them. So, so you viewed those more as a talent acquisition. Than- I, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I go. I, that's exactly what I do. I literally go out and I look for small companies that are. Tree industry is tough. Equipment's always breaking. We got to deal with. You got to deal with diesel mechanics. You got to deal with welders. You got to deal with hydraulics. You got to deal with DOT, which is the Department of Transportation, because you're driving CDL trucks. You got it. There's a lot that goes on. So that that's where like all these businesses that you've listed prior come in. I, I build a mechanic shop. I have a weld shop. I have a hydraulic hose making station. Some guys base their whole business off of making hydraulic hoses. Like it's a $30,000 machine. I went out and bought it with all the fittings and stuff like that, just so I can have it at my yard so I can, you know, and then, you know, we, we sell stuff along the way too. So yeah, yeah. So yeah, kind of supporting nodes yeah. on your business that you can actually make a little extra money with them too. Yeah, yeah. We have a mechanic shop that we inspect uh, a lot of landscapers' trailers. We'll maintain their dingoes or their excavators or their skid steers or their stump grinders. Uh, if they have a something real jacked up on their truck, they need welded. I have a fantastic welder, Jim. He's a one of my Real good friends growing up, one of my best friends growing up, uh, high school guy, his dad, and um, yeah. So I have a really, I just like, I'm exactly, I'm a talent acquisition guy. Like, if I see somebody that's talented, I don't really give a shit what they do. I, I just want them, I want to work with them. Like, I have a dumpster company too. Uh, that's not on there, but we, so I, I do dumpsters, um, I do tree work, I do mechanic work. We, we can do welding work. Um, we do it on our own stuff. I don't like to overload him because he has retired, but we do some welding work. And then uh, we do a lot of plant health care, which is like um, treating trees and uh, for disease and stuff like that, too. So that's all part of tree work. But that's upper level tree work, like actually caring about the tree and trying to see it sort of thrive through a tough environment or disease. So that's one thing we've seen is a lot of tree companies where it's like, they literally just want to cut down trees and haul. Yeah. I see it all the time. Yeah. I I tell people all the time, like, why would you get rid of that tree? It's literally all you got right now. And, uh, I, I try and talk people out of removal all the time. We actually, we actually are doing an initiative right now that at executive. So for every tree we remove this year, we're going to plant a tree and we're uh, recording all the trees that we plant locally but uh we're also going to donate money to the i er, through isa um it's like plant a tree foundation and though a tree will get planted for everyone that's removed so yeah so with all these different businesses is your plan to scale them all kind of simultaneously or do you view some businesses mainly as a support system for your main business um <clears throat> supports there are support systems but are they some of them scalable yeah it's definitely it, you got to see like where you get in where you fit in type deal yeah I, I some of them i see scalable but then also like some guys come to me with like really good ideas and uh i kind of want to get involved in their business too so like i've been approached with two really good businesses lately that like really intrigued me that i think that they could go national and um and if they did get national they would have a lot of potential for growth and expansion so outside of the original idea of what they think so yeah i look for opportunity everywhere i go i do like i I, circuit management that's all my real estate properties i have a bunch of rental properties and stuff and i've been doing that for 10 years now um i I owned four rental properties before i moved out of my mommy's attic so i moved out of my mom's attic when i was 28 when my my wife bought a house because I owned four houses. I couldn't even get a mortgage because I was self-employed because of that whole 2008 thing. So, yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah, right. So um, we wanted to talk a little bit about some of the principles you follow now in business. Like what are some of the philosophies that you try to instill in your co- almost like company culture stuff, but stuff that has helped you that you try to push through all the different levels of your business? <sighs> I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? Yeah. So just 
wanted to get some of the philosophies you follow as right. a leader in your business that you try to pass down through all your employees and all the different companies. It's tough, man. Keeping culture up is like the toughest thing in business. It really is because <clears throat> we all deal with personal things. And like our guys are going to have bad days and we're going to have bad days. So um, trying to overcome all that is, is a real difficult thing. Uh, we wake up. We show up to work every day at six thirty. There's something my manager Doug is there. It's it's a it's very it's the same thing every day. Uh, the the guys are on the same crew every day. We don't try and move things around a lot because people are super resistant to change. It could be the littlest thing, and you're just like, what the heck is this? So, um, we try and we try and keep things together as much as possible to keep it rolling down the track. <clears throat> So, I heard uh, you were telling me that you do beekeeping as well. Yeah. As like, uh, why did you choose that? So, beekeeping came about through that mentor I mentioned. He has a huge tree company, lots of real estate. And that's why, I, I, right in the end, real estate is like probably my real love. I just, it's such a good way to make residual money. But this guy, I went, I wanted to learn a lot from him, and I was hanging out following him around basically i literally called him this week and said let me come uh hold your coffee cup for you for a day i was like he's like i'm so fucking busy i can't you know because he's guy this guy run you think i run a lot of businesses used to see this guy and uh he kills it but um i just kind of like picked his brain and you know learn from guys like that so yeah you were saying you offer to work for free just to yeah, uh, get yeah. there and, and talk to him so he has like 20 hives and uh i went out and i just said dude i'll let me just work for you and see what you're doing and then i asked him why he did it and there's so there's so many important things about bees that like <clears throat> we don't even know if you get stung residually throughout your life you'll never get arthritis like if you get stung like a couple times a year by a honeybee you'll never get arthritis and uh, i thought that was cool um the honey honey's so good and then also like if you get used to bees like you can go in there without a suit on and and just kind of you ever see those tiktok videos where girls got like bees all over her arm and you, like you can do that and you, you just gotta learn it's it's literally a bug that's this big and and are you gonna let it be better than you and if it comes at you real tough like don't freak out just be cool like be you know and sit there's a lot that goes to it. And then also there's a high failure rate with beekeeping too. So bees can get a lot of different things like mites and they can get um, hive moth or hive beetle. There's all sorts of different disease or, that comes through. So like it teaches you about like you can do everything you want the right way and you can still fail. Or you could just have this one hive over there that you don't touch at all and yields the best results. Like sometimes there is no rhyme or reason behind it, but you know, and also they're, they're great for our environment, which is cool. And, uh, they, they have honey. <laughs> I've seen some people though, like rent out their hive to pollinate yeah. farms and fields and stuff. Do you guys ever get into that side of it or? So no, I work with a guy though. He does that. Yeah. Eli, Eli's honeybees. Yeah. And, uh, he works up here in Chester County a lot and he'll go from home to home where he'll set up hives. He can either, you can pay him or he can pay you in honey. He's got a deal worked okay. out. So, but yeah, he, it's, it's good where he provides you with honey from your own land. And that's, it's like a probiotic when you have honey that's local. Um, I've got jars for you guys. I didn't bring it in, but I've got jars for you guys. And, um, it's a probiotic. You eat honey within a 15 mile range of where the bees cross pollinate with the trees. So say you have a hive here and you eat the honey from your hive, you're not going to get allergies because you live here. You're breathing in the pollen here. So the, the bees are going out and seeking out that pollen and bringing it back and creating honey with that pollen. So you're basically, it's like a, um, antihistamine, I guess I'm not a doctor, but like probiotic. So yeah. Um, is that, is, great. is that something you're turning into a business or is it just a hobby? So it's like branding, to be honest with you. So, so my, the, the guy that I mentor, that's, he's like in his seventies. I was like, what's with the honey? He's like, dude, he's like, people fucking love honey. He's like, you just got to give him some money. He said, he told me, he said, sometimes when I run out of honey, I'll go to the grocery store and I'll buy some honey and I'll rip the sticker off. I'll put mine on. He's like, it's not about the honey. It's about having your label on their counter for six months. Mm. yeah 
Yeah. And I have girls that sell for me on Instagram that have like 20, 30,000 followers. Shout out to Meg and Chrissy Dirk in the end. And, uh, uh, these girls, the Dimes Club, they sell it in their boutique. Sell them the honey? Yeah, and uh, Ardmore. What's your honey brand? Uh, it's, it just says Executive Tree Care on it. But uh, we're, we actually came up with a new logo, and uh, Rob, my uh, my internet guy, he's he's got a, a really good artist that is uh, creating a new label for us and we've got it in boutiques we're selling it online now um i don't know it's 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 kind of a whirlwind to be honest with you i'm just kind of like packaging it and shipping it out but it's revenue right it's 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 part of the deal but also yeah i uh i'll i'll bring it to these public events where like these community days i said and i'll sell it at the table people will buy it um i go to i go to two different gyms uh Fort Delco, that's where I lift weights, and the the vault in Morton, that's Jiu Jitsu gym, and uh, they people there, they love it. So I'm I'm getting I'm constantly getting hit up at the gym, like, yo, you got any honey on you? It's, it's like selling dime bags of weed or something <laughs> like that. I go out selling honey all the time. It's crazy. That's awesome. Um, so what advice would you give to someone who's trying to start a business or is looking to beef up one that's not doing so great? What's like your kind of top level advice? Um, I guess read those books. Read start. some books. I swear, I was literally just about to say, read the E Myth. Like, yeah, like do what you do best, and and let others do what do they do best. Like, learn how to be more of a town act, more of a town acquisition company than like a service company. Like, if you see somebody does something good, like all people do. All people have good qualities. Do they have bad qualities too? For sure. You just got to make sure that they're they're exemplifying like what they do best during the day and then they can be in the best environment and you know you just gotta put people in the right environments it's which is tough dude working with people is really tough but yeah reading books um seeking out mentors um having conversations with people um uh, even though if they're in your, in your industry and it's uber competitive, like tree guys all don't get along, but if they don't get along from my neighborhood, I'll go find in, in another neighborhood and I'll ask them the same questions. You know, it's like, Hey, I'm not going to be bothering you, but I got a couple questions. So I, I, I'm never like, like I said, when I first started, I was literally knocking on corporate doors being like, yo, why isn't your snow plowed? You better plow it right now. Somebody's going to sue you. And I ended up getting contracts on it. You just got to go out there and ask these questions. Like, you, you just got to do it. I, I have pretty good confidence. And, uh, yeah, just go out and go and do. Don't, like, talk is cheap actions. Act, talk is cheap actions which cost money. So it's it's cheap to talk about things. Like, you know, if you guys ask me to come do this podcast. I'm like, what is it going to take me, two hours? And some words like i can i can knock that out i might learn something new today so so um what's the plan for the future do you have any acquisitions lined up or what's your do you have any long-term goals like where you want to be in five ten years yeah but i have nda signed so okay yeah. i actually am in the middle of something right now but, but yeah. growth is yeah. on the menu yeah definitely yeah it's, it's right it's, it's on the plate it's not even on the menu yeah it's on the plate um yeah, we always so I write down my goals every year, right? I write down my personal goals, and then we sit down as a company and we write our annual goal. We'll, we'll talk about fiscally. We'll meet quarterly about sales. Um, I'm not perfect, so it's not. It doesn't always happen perfectly, but um, yeah, I write down goals. Like I, I literally on my desk, I have like from. 2019 the nails annual goals and i literally just cross them off as i go and if they don't get done that year they get shifted over to the next year so yeah and then i i write down my daily goals too like i write like usually i have a copy book on me i'll write down all my stuff or that or i'll call allison i'll be like hey can you like throw these things in my schedule and i'll pull up my ipad and i'll complete the tasks like <clears throat> when you write something down and cross it off it creates an endorphin in your head so it's like you know, if I, uh, sometimes I'll think of something to do, I'll write it down. I'll, I'll go out and complete it. I'll still write it down and cross it off. Cause it's like, all right, I know I completed that on the state. I can revert back to this and see how my, like, it's so, so important to record things. I wish I recorded more and took more pictures at the beginning of my business. So I could show people literally, I started with a pickup truck and a chainsaw to now having 30 full-time employees, you know, and, and doing, you know, well in seven figures a year so 
Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Um, anything else you want to add, Jeremy? No, I think that's it. I think um, there's a lot to take away from this conversation, so we'll be um, paying attention to that as we move forward. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Jeremy, thanks so much for coming on the show. Anytime, yeah. Thanks for having me. Of course. It's a great opportunity. Appreciate it. Stories from the Top is your guide to successful business development. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts or find Edge of Cinema on YouTube. Stories from the Top is an Edge of Cinema production hosted by Matthew Skura and Jeremy Schmidt. To learn more or get in touch, visit edgeofcinema.com slash podcast. 